Our our first uh, script is titled Cynthia's Playground, written by Georgia McCartney. Georgia, tell us a little bit about this story before we start. Okay. Um, uh, Cynthia's Playground is uh, a little bit about this girl who's, um, you know, of course, named Cynthia. And um, she's disabled. She's blind. Like, she can't see a thing. But she was born that way. And it's just kind of going over her and her struggles. And, uh, yeah. So. All right. Disclaimer. Yeah. So here we go. Yeah. Disclaimer. You're listening to Stark Actors on the Airwaves. All characters appearing in this work are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. You're listening to Stark Actors... Oh, I played it again. My bad. All right, go. <laughs> I think they know. All right, guys, which, who am I sharing a mic with now? You come here or, here. or there. You can come over here because I'm not in it at all. You guys are. Oh, hey. So all I'm going right. to hop off. Hulk. Yeah. Um, here we go. Whenever you guys are ready. Okay. Who's playing who? Okay, I, I've sorry. got this. I'm going to start. I'm just waiting for Jamie. Okay. 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 I think everybody's settled. I think we're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, here we go. I Cynthia's Playground. Here. Okay. M- may I play too? The other children just stared at her. They stood where they were, their leader clutching the ball tightly. He took one quick look at the girl's milky eyes and slowly started to step back. Then, little by little, the rest of the young gang followed until all of them began to run off. Hearing the escaping footsteps, the little girl cried out, Wait, wait, please don't go. Some of the children hesitated, but none listened. In a minute, they were all gone, leaving young, seven-year-old Cynthia all by herself. Tears welled up in her eyes as she ran off in the opposite direction. She took refuge under a big tree she knew well. It was there. It was sturdy. It couldn't run away. She sat there for a while, head buried in her hands and knees curled up. Why did... Why did everybody run away like that? How come everyone else thought she was incapable of doing what they did? What was this thing called seeing? And why did it make everyone better than her? Time passed and Cynthia just continued to sit there. She was unsure of how long it had been. Just then, she heard a voice. What are you doing over here all by yourself? Why aren't you playing with the others? Cynthia turned her head up toward the direction of the voice. It sounded caring, welcoming. The other kids don't want to play with me. Why not? You look like a perfectly fine playmate to me. It's because I'm blind. They think I can't do anything. It's not fair. The stranger paused and then replied. But is that really true? Is nothing all you're capable of? Cynthia jolted and stood up. No, it isn't. I can do whatever I want. The stranger smiled. Then they're the ones who are wrong. It's their loss, and we can't change the decisions they make. We can, however, change ourselves. I want you to play with me. Uh, But... Don't hesitate. You're just believing what the other kids say about you now. Let's find our own way of playing. If we can't do their way, we can make our own way. Cynthia stood there. That sounded great. However, uh, uh, but, okay, no buts. But I mean, how? How should we play? I, I, I can't see the ball. Hmm. The other young girl thought to herself for a moment. She ran a hand through her light brown hair, pulled back into a ponytail. I've got it! Cynthia was surprised. What was it? We play catch using elec- <laughs> yeah, eco-location. Eco-location. Eco-location? The young, light purple-haired girl tilted her head. What's echolocation? It's where you use sound to locate an object. You make a small noise, and by judging how long it takes to bounce back to reach your ears, you can tell how far away it is. Dolphins do it. The blind girl's face lit up. That sounded like the coolest thing ever. That's really awesome. Let's try it. I'll start. Cynthia's new friend closed her eyes and made a soft clicking noise with her tongue as she gently rolled the ball toward the other. As the ball rolled toward Cynthia, the clicks became more quiet the farther away it rolled. As Cynthia followed the suit, the clicks became louder for her as the ball approached until she could tell the ball was right in front of her. She quickly grabbed it. It... it worked! Not perfectly, though, since the ball had already stopped by the time it got to her, but she understood how it worked. And with practice, she could really go places with this. Overjoyed, Cynthia sprang to her feet. I, I got it! I got it! Oh, thank you! Th- thank you so much! 
Um, the other little girl lifted her head a bit in surprise. My name is Christina, but my friends and family call me Stina. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Christina. No problem. And hey, I'm about your age. I never caught your name either, though. Cynthia smiled. Oh, I- I'm Cynthia Rose. Well, it's a pleasure to have played with you, Cynthia. Cynthia paused for a moment. Will, will you keep playing with me? Of course! I was hoping you'd say that. The two little girls continued their game for a long while. Soon, they progressed from rolling the ball to throwing it back and forth to each other, and finally, taking a step back and tossing it. The sun seemed to set on their day all too soon. Cynthia, it's getting dark, and I need to get going before I'm missed. Cynthia frowned. Uh, I should probably do that, too. Can we play again sometime? Sure thing! I don't go to your school, but let's meet up here on this playground every so often, okay? I can't make I can't wait to make up all sorts of new games with you. Awesome. Oh, um, don't forget your ball though. Little Cynthia held out her hand to return the toy. Keep it. And bring it to this playground every so often so we can play with it more. Uh, all right. That sounds like a plan. See you later, Christina. Bye, Cynthia. I'm glad I met you today. And with that, the little girl with brown hair and eyes, sun-kissed skin and freckles walked off. Cynthia clutched the ball as her mom found her and called her home for dinner. Aww. Aww. Can we do a simultane- simultaneous aww? Aww. 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 That, your scripts always get that. They yeah, do. that happens yeah. like at the end of every the single one of my scripts. It's going to get it too. I've read it. It's going to get it. Yeah? It's like yeah. always oh. aww. Um, a conflict of nature, like, right? Yeah, Jamie we get my and down. me. So if you're yeah. on the end, it's like somebody brought in like a box of puppies and just like dumped it in the studio, and all these little puppies are just kind of walking around. And everyone's like, "Oh, I want to move over there." And have Michelle come over here, and we we'll go over there because there's more room. Yeah, move okay. over here yeah, 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 by yeah. me. Yeah, sounds good. Musical chairs yeah. in the studio. <laughs> so much fun. Hulk looks so angry. It takes physical coordination to be on the air. That's, that's awesome, guys. <laughs> it does. Last week, I was running back and forth creating your door sound effects. Well, I yeah. was. It is, it is a workout. They were yes. well appreciated. Yes. Make it okay, we've got four kind of hours of ocean noise. noise. Can you, can you what? Both of us we've got four well? hours yes. of ocean noise. <laughs> I'm going to start it really loud, and then I'll fade it down, and then you begin. Okay? Okay, yeah. this next one is written by myself and Michelle. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear me. Okay. And um, we're going to have to explain this one a lot. Oh, yeah, it's sci-fi. Yes, sorry. (laughs) All right, this one is called A Conflict of Nature, and it's um, science fiction. And my character, Amos, he's like this really tall fish-like guy. And in his his race, the the males are the ones that carry the kids. And, like, he's kind of like a seahorse in a way that he just kind of, like, drops them off in the ocean. They're supposed to, like like i don't know live <laughs> and so you explain your guy they're basically like sea turtles they yeah. leave their babies to fend for themselves yeah How um <laughs> what? mike How <laughs> my Super character caring. algarog he's um he's uh li- he's a reptilian kind of lizard-like creature roughly the same height as amos even though he kind of slouches a lot so technically he's taller um his species is well it's pretty pacifistic they grow these um these spines that start at their head and extend down to their tail on along the spine that uh if they if they uh their flight or their fight or flight response kicks in they'll harden and leak venom <laughs> uh in their species the ma- no, the female lays the egg and then the male is supposed to incubate it and care for the no, and care for the children once they're hatched alongside their mate um, the female, no, in some pairings, the female leaves, but in some they stay. It's, it just depends on the couple. But for the most part, the male has a very, very strong mothering, no, has a very, very strong parenting instinct. Mm-hmm. Okay, so <coughs> that's really important to understand for yes. this script. Okay, Conflict of Nature, written by Christina Zorich and Michelle Hodgson. You're listening to Stark Actors on the Airwaves. All characters appearing in this work are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Algrog is pacing back and forth in front of the ocean. 
He's been doing this for so long that someone joked that he was wearing a groove into the floor. With his tail dragging the ground behind him, this actually wasn't a joke. A small trail was indeed starting to be worn into the ground. A deep frown tugs at the corners of his mouth, and he tucks his clawed hands in even closer to his body. The seven-foot-tall, white, slender creature walks outside to check on the water and what lay inside it. Al Grob, what are you doing here? The reptilian creature who'd been staring at the water turns his head to look at Amos. I was checking on them. Are you sure it's all right for them to be here alone? The white alien tilts his head to the side, the membrane in the corner of his eyes sliding sideways over them as he blinks. Amos had a habit of blinking when he was worried or very intrigued in the conversation, which, being a scientist, meant that he was blinking an awful lot. Why, of course. That is what my kind does. Release the eggs into the water for them to live and grow strong. The strong shall live and the weak shall die and be used as food for other creatures. That is why we lay so many eggs. I thought I had explained this to you, hmm? Algarog's frown deepens. You did. But it just seems so... Brutal. My species. We incubate the eggs ourselves, and then we care for them afterward, at the very least until their venom glands kick in, but often much later. To just say that some will die, and be okay with that. Amos places a hand with three fingers on the other's shoulder. But that is your kind. My species is different. One way is not better than the other. I know it must be hard for you to see them on, go on their way so young, but please try and understand... If the eggs stayed here with us, they would suffer greatly and grow slower. My people are meant to be in the water. Amos smiled. (laughs) I apologize again. I am sorry. We should go inside from all of this, hmm? What would take your mind off of it? I... He looks at the water again. Would it hurt if I went into the water with them instead? I I worry that, that my venom might leak from my spines and taint the water, I admit. But... They only make venom if I sense danger. There is no danger here, I believe. (laughs) Of course it is dangerous. Why else would I say that the eggs could get eaten? There are far bigger creatures down there than you think. Just let them go. They are fine. I know in your culture that it is wrong, and I understand that. But my species' eggs and your species' eggs are completely different. Mine are meant to do this very thing, and you try to to deny them their biological rights? Do you understand what I mean, Algorog? I wouldn't want your eggs hatched because it is not in my nature to. Uh, Oh dear, I hope I am making sense. Am I? I do not know anymore. The scientist sighed, knowing that Algarog wouldn't be able to stop worrying. It seemed to be in his nature. But I would not leave my eggs alone because it is not in my nature. He presses a hand to his chest, his eyes widening as he beseeches the other. I know that the eggs are of your species. But they will contain traces of my genetics as well, won't they? What if it's bad for them to not experience a bit of both? I... I don't know, Amos. I knew going into this that it would be different, but... It's so hard. He lowers his head, his upper body dipping down with it. He tilts his head back to look up at Amos and then to the side to look at the water. How long will it be before they hatch? Before they can come onto land? It won't take them very long at all. They can reach the surface of the water within a few hours. We can stay and wait for them if you wish. Will that make you feel better? Amos blinked rapidly again. What about to hatch? Oh, I am sorry. Maybe I didn't explain well. They arrive on the surface once they hatch. It's their first instinct. Oh. You said they could reach the surface within a few hours, so I assumed... Never mind, my my mistake. That's soon, though. Our eggs take, take much longer to hatch. It's only been a couple days, hasn't it? Amos tilts his head again, not understanding. What did you mean, not understand? My apologies. And yes, they have been down there for two days. They should hatch any minute now. Amos folds his hand in front of him, waiting patiently for the few hours to pass. If Algarag would not go inside and wait, then he would stand and wait with him. He had other things to do with his research, but right now he would rather help out a friend who helped him and his race. It seemed only fair. Algarog blinks in mild surprise, turning his head once more to stare longingly at the water. He walks closer to the water until he is, it is right, he is right on its edge and settles down there. He dips his claws, six-fingered hand, into the water. So fast. 
He glances back at Amos, blinks, and then shyly returns his gaze to the water. Yes, indeed. Oh, I want to thank you for being a part of the experiment and helping out my race. I am greatly indebted to you. The white alien lowered his long neck, the fins on the top of his head extending to show his gratitude. Algarag nods his head and gives him a small and somewhat sheepish smile. Or at least as sheepish as a nearly eight-foot-tall lizard man can manage. It's fine. You don't need to thank me, but, um... He shakes his head and then lowers his head to rest on the ground, tilted and watching the water for any signs of life. Never mind. The scientist blinks again. What? What is it? I wish to hear what you have to say. I was just going to ask if you wanted to lie down and wait with me. The scientist immediately sat down next to the other, his legs crossed, his knees so long they reached up to his torso. Why, of course. Anything for you. Algarag gives a grateful, if somewhat strained, smile to the other. He shifts until his body and tail curled around Amos's sitting form, not unlike a snake. He hesitates for a moment before leaning his head to rest against Amos's leg, his arms folded under his chin. Thank you. I'm sorry for being so difficult. Amos felt the other's body against him, glad he could give comfort to Algarag. It was a gentle touch, one that Amos could only feel if it were against his fins. The rest of his scales were tough and made feeling very difficult. It is fine. I understand why you are so worried. I am the one who should apologize for being so strict on you. You didn't have to be a part of the experiment, you know. You had a choice to say no, but I am glad you said yes. I know I had a choice. One of the first I've had to make in a long time. And it's hard. But I don't regret it. As long as they'll remain with me, as long as you'll remain with me, at the least until they arrive, that is all I need. The end. I really want to turn up there for effect. <laughs> then we fade it out. What'd right. you guys think of that one? Fade away I with like that one. Our first sci-fi. Isn't it I really like that. Like, okay, I don't like sci-fi, but it's like, like I said, it really relates to like human qualities so you understand it. Like that's, yeah. that was the key. That's the that's key what, to writing sci-fi and you, yeah. you nailed it. So yeah. good job. It. Okay, next I believe. Just two parenting, no, just two parents arguing over their, like, <laughs> well, very, very passively, aggressively arguing over how to parent. So yeah. can you hand me my scripts? <laughs> oh, where are they? Oh, under Hulk? Yes. yes. Okay. And actually, Georgia, could I have my number three <gasps> script? Did you, we should get a picture of Hulk wearing Thank the you. headphones sitting by the board. <laughs> <laughs> and then put that on the Facebook, because that would look really cute. It, it totally would. Should. I don't know where the other copy of, I'll, I'll just sit over there by you. That's fine. Because the next thing is, um, the next thing is your song. It's not, yeah, I'm going to be performing poetically the chorus of a song with Christina. Yes, so we're going to play musical chairs a little bit right now. I'm going to switch with you. So. I should have another script. I'll just read this narration, I suppose. <laughs> so Jamie's got the best voice for narrating. <laughs> Gaming community friends are the best ever. They don't listen to me. No. <laughs> I'm singing about you. <laughs> People walked by and they didn't pay attention. No. All right. I was serenading them. I hope right. you guys liked that last one because that was our first sci-fi. Yep. I, I really liked that one. I'm picky about sci-fi and I liked that one. Oh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm also picky about the only sci-fi I like. Like, I like fantasy. The only sci-fi I like is Star Trek. And that's about <laughs> it. So Trek's I like good that. good stuff, though. It is. It's the best stuff. All right. So, Beth, explain what this is to our listeners. It's seriously just, it's the chorus of the song You and I by Ingrid Michaelson. And I just thought it would, like... I just have always pictured it as like a short conversation between a guy and a girl and I think it works. I think it's really cute. So we're just going to do like, it's like 30 seconds and it's just the chorus of the song and then we're going to play the song so you'll hear it in context and it's a, it's just so cute. So here we go. The song is You and I by Ingrid Michaelson and we're just going to like read the chorus in a poetic, theatric manner. Written by Beth. It's not written by me. I know. I arranged it. Arranged. Oh. I arranged. Arranged by the Beth. Short. All right, arranged here we go. Arranged by Beth. Song by Ingrid Michaelson. Ingrid Michaelson. My bad. Here we go. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> a boy and girl are sitting in a moving car. The boy is driving and the girl is in the passenger seat. They are driving through the French countryside on a cool summer afternoon. There is not a single cloud in the soft blue sky. Let's get rich. <laughs> okay. I mean, let's get rich and buy our parents' homes in the south of France. 
Or let's get rich and get it and give everybody nice sweaters. Oh, and teach them how to dance. <laughs> let's get rich and build a house on a mountain, making everybody look like ants. From way up there? From way up there. <laughs> you and I. You and I. You and I. I'm, I'm, I make, nah, I messed that up, but here's the song. Oh, and I feel terrible. That's okay. <laughs> Enjoy. Are they working? Yeah. Okay, cool. Wow, that was perfect. You're listening to the Radio Voice of Mount Union, WRMU 91.1. Stark Actors on the Airwaves. Yeah. Coming Woo. to you live from Stark County. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> One word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> this next, um, this next Georgia, oh, I thought you had the camera by me, she was, I thought she was being a creeper and like going <laughs> click. Okay, this next one, close up. this next one is, oh, wait, oh, you need, you need to go over here too. What am I yeah, doing? Yeah, I'm going to share that's with you. That's why, that's I'm why. That's why I'm over here. Okay, <laughs> can we move this anymore, or, wait, I got this. Yeah, or you could both move over here. No, 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 Georgia. Good. Okay, we got this. We got this. Can we hear you? Okay. This next one is called Auditions. And my character, Raphael, who appeared last week, is in this one. He's going to act a little differently because he kind of has mood swings. He's either really grumpy, depending on what's going on, or, like, he gets really irritated all the time. Or he's really, really passionate, really exciting, kind of like a diva. Like, really (laughs) bad. And he's a playwright and director and an actor, and he's a little bit full of himself, but... um, yeah. Love you, Uncle Raphael. Hey, love you too. <laughs> and um, this is written by. Um, I can't hear myself anymore, or is it just my headphones? You gotta speak like right, it might be your headphones. Wait, can I hear it at all? No, I can. It's you gotta just, speak like right into this. Like, yeah, but Jamie then and I were like moving like kind of out of the way. Like speak, move out of the way. Yeah, you gotta be like yeah. right into it. Okay, so this was written by me in Georgia, and Georgia, you want to say a little bit before we introduce who's playing who? Okay, well, like we said, we've got Raphael, and we've also got my characters, uh, Jesse and Ace. They're, Ace is a professional actor, and um, Jesse, Jesse is a professional stunt double. Actually, if you were paying attention to like earlier shows, this is the same Jesse and Ace we've uh, written briefly about before, like the storybook we read earlier. Um, these are the same little kids. They were. Um, it's like kind of skipped ahead, and now it's like in the future where they have been adopted and they got adopted by like this stage manager so um and then the stage manager was friends with like this director so and then that's how they got into acting so that's where they are today if that makes sense okay and so the play or script i don't know takes place of jesse and ace are going to try out for auditions for Raphael, and i will be playing my character Raphael. georgia will be playing jesse our for our newest guest here, Ty, is going to be playing Ace, and Jamie is our lovely narrator because she has such a beautiful voice. You always have to have lovely. <laughs> I, I feel like it. every time lovely. you say I'm narrating, lovely. you say something about my voice. Lovely voice. You're gonna like oh turn me into a horrible person. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But um, as a side note, um, on our Facebook page, um, what's the Facebook page name again? WRMU Stark Actors on the Airwaves. Yeah, if you're ever confused about like these characters or you need like a like timeline or you just want to see what they look like because you're a cool kid like that yeah just just go up to um our facebook page and there's like albums and it's got like each one of our characters and it's got like jesse's story on there yeah if, their bios. if they come on more than twice on the show then they'll appear there and georgia draws most like a, a 90 percent of them <laughs> michelle draws <laughs> some more hopefully we get some more artists so it's not just like georgia's gallery yeah michelle will. i have a few that i haven't put any yet do you have your script with you because i'm sharing yours Okay, are you sure? Yeah, I can't find mine. All right. Is it? That's oh, wait, 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 wait. Over there. I have it. Let's oh, you have, have it? it. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry. I did find mine. Good. I wondered why I had extras. Okay. You're listening That's to Stark Actors on the Airwaves. Jamie, All characters think? appearing in this work are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Oh, I'm so glad you can make it. Here are the scripts. We'll only be looking at a few pages tonight. The callbacks, of course, will be tomorrow night, and I know for sure that you two will get parts. I've seen you in so many things. Oh, this is so exciting to see you both. What am I doing being rude? Take off your jackets and sit down. There's water on the side of the stage if you need any. Ace stood there for a moment. He wasn't expecting the director to be so... friendly, excitable, or... well, anything that he was being right now. Ace's own director was such a hard case, so this new one was really throwing Ace for a loop. Ace hadn't quite 
hadn't quit working for his old director or anything. It was just that they were on a break. Ace's sister Jessie had caught word of this new play that involved pirates and wouldn't shut up about it. Ace agreed to try it out to try out with her. Besides, it sounded like fun. Jessie smiled and nodded at the new director. Her excitability was matching his as she happily took off her jacket and spun around, waving her script in front of Ace. Did you hear that? He said for sure we'd get the parts. Isn't this exciting, Ace? Y- yeah, I heard. I'm excited. I'm just surprised, you know? I wasn't expecting it to be this easy. Or for him to do research on us. I mean, it usually goes the other way around. And aren't you getting a bit ahead of yourself, Jesse? Weren't you gonna do the stunt devil part? Raphael looked at the two of them, of them his mouth open in shock. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. She's gonna be a stunt devil? I thought she was, she was going to be an actress. You look like a fine actress, my dear. Raphael always got overly excited when it came to his line of work. It was the only thing that really made him smile anymore. The feel of the typewriter under his fingers, the sounds it made against the paper as he wrote. And yes, he was old-fashioned enough to use a typewriter still. And he always loved finding the right people for the parts. And that was probably his favorite part of the whole process. Well, um, Jesse is... That is... I've never acted before! Oh, you haven't? Well, tell me more about your career as a stunt double, then. There's a lot of action in this one, so I'm pretty sure I can fit you in a position there. Raphael scooted a wooden chair across the floor. Why don't you sit down? Don't be shy. I don't bite. Nope. I'm usually cast as an action girl. My career as a stunt double has been awesome. I usually double for um, an actor named uh, Isabel Fulton. I've doubled for her many, many times in movies and plays. Ever since I was little, actually. In fact, since I was 12, I forget, but it's been a while. Ace, was I 12? Anyway, um, I always watch Ace and Isabel act, so I could try it if you want. Ace watched Jesse a little nervously. He gulped, hoping the new director would take this well. Just then, he noticed Mr. Clermont scoot some chairs their way. He looked up and then took a seat. Okay, thanks, Mr. Clermont. Thank you, too. Jessie took a seat, too, but after a few minutes, she started rocking back and forth in it. Raphael sat down, too. If being a stunt double is your specialty, then we will for sure let you be a stunt double. Hmm. Although, that may be a problem. Only men on the ship get wounded in fight. The, wind don't, the women don't really get wounded. Would we be able to dress you as a man? Or, or maybe we could use a pirate that attacks the other ship and stabs a young boy. What do you think? That would be awesome. I love doubling, so I would for sure appreciate that, Mr. Direc- director Man. Ace thought to himself. Oh, jeez, Jesse, learn his name. Uh, I could dress as a dude if uh, you've got a wig, a good wig, that is. I mean, um, you won't really need to see my face for some of the action shots, right? That's the way we've done it with my other director, Mr. Fulton. I've doubled for Ace once when he was... Jesse, TMI. Ah, uh, well, that is, I'd be down for a role as an attacker, too. I'm experienced in martial arts as well as swordmanship. I'm also a good break dancer. Jesse, pirates don't dance. They could. Uh, um, Jesse, uh, you have a spark to you. I like that. Good energy. Raphael crossed his legs at his ankles and took out a yellow notepad. He started giggling. <laughs> I'm sorry, you two are just too hysterical. Jesse, you remind me of a nephew, my nephew, being all energetic, and not to mention you don't really think before you speak, do you? Raphael raised an eyebrow and clicked his pen. It's all right, Ace. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Here, we've had a man play a woman in a dress as a boy before, so really, gender doesn't really matter in my theater, although I am really interested on why that was TMI. You hear that, Ace? He says I have a spark. Jessie shook Ace a bit as she spoke. I heard. <laughs> I heard, Jessie. I do. Uh, what's your nephew's name? Oh, um... Ace frowned at Raphael, calling Jessie out on the fact that she tended to speak without thinking. Hey, there was no need to get bitey. Jessie was just... Jessie. I, I guess I don't really think before I speak. She said sheepishly. Ace nudged her and gave her a reassuring smile. She smiled back. Well, to answer your question, it was TMI because, well... Ace turned red. I tried the stunt at first, but I twisted my ankle in the process. So the only one who was successfully able to do it was Jessie. 
Raphael felt guilty for mentioning his nephew. It wasn't an insult. It was a compliment, really. It's fine, Ace. Things like that happen. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And as for you, Jesse... Raphael leaned in toward her in his chair. Saying what you think isn't always a bad thing, although there are times when one has to filter it. Don't go all mopey on me, all right? I have enough depression in my lifespan, and I hate seeing people upset. The blonde director cleared his throat and pulled a piece of his short, choppy hair out of his face as he looked down at the script. He didn't want to talk about depression anymore. He didn't want to talk about how many times a day went bad, and he went home with a bottle of wine in his hand after already consuming a first. Depression was a regular thing to him. Now, let's start the read-through, shall we? Ace, will you look at page 24 for me and start reading from there to the middle of page 25? Ace nodded and felt a little better when he realized the director was very understanding. As Raphael leaned closer into Jesse's seat, she snapped upright, just short of accidentally hitting him. She smiled at what he had to say. Oh, don't worry. I won't go all, go all mopey on you. I'm still pretty happy right now. I mean, I get to do a stunt, Ace is here, and you seem like a nice guy, so I'm not sad. Ace and Jesse both turned to the page 24. Ace started looking over the part. He stared at the character he was going to play. The character was a young captain looking for a medical cure for a friend in need. When Ace analyzed the character earlier, he was surprisingly a lot like himself. The fact made him look forward to playing the role. Ace then cleared his throat. He closed his eyes for a moment and took a deep breath. He then began reading his lines. Everyone, it has been brought to my attention that my friend's condition is worsening. Due to this, I find it in our best interest to set out to find the cure tonight. Raphael went along to read the other character's lines with him. I agree. We should search now. Mr. K, please get my map for my quarters. I wish to finish my meal before we leave. There was a woman's part next, and Raphael wanted to know how good Jesse was. Uh, you can read the next part, Jesse. The both of you. Ace and Jesse looked at each other and nodded. Jesse looked down at the script. She wasn't 100% sure she could do this, but she wanted to try. She just thought of how good Isabel and Ace were, and she acted like them. They served as good inspiration for her. The part was a little difficult for her, though. Jesse would be reading for a lady named Colette, who had just set Ace's character over the edge. She wasn't that experienced in being menacing, but she would try. What a huge pain. Your friend's nothing but trouble. Ace then quickly followed with his character's line. Why, you, you, you take that back, Missy. Jesse immediately jolted. She wasn't used to seeing Ace angry like that. She forgot that they were acting for a moment. Ace, no! Raphael smiled when he saw the two respond well to the script. <laughs> Very good. I think you'll do well as the young captain. I don't even know if any other read-throughs will be necessary. Oh, and Jesse, it's up to you whether or not you want the role. Uh, I can tell you can be a, that you'll be great at either. Yes, Raphael was always an op optimist whenever it came to finding the right people to play his roles. He would have his mind set on one person and one alone for a single role and was stubborn enough to get his way, even if that person didn't necessarily want the role. He stood and walked to the side of the stage, lifting two wooden swords. Will you two be back tomorrow night at seven? Well, you'll meet the rest of the cast then. Oh, and before you leave, how about a sword fight, Captain? The siblings looked over and their frowns became smiles as the director responded well to their performance. Wow. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Ace, Ace! He, think I can, he thinks I can be great! Woohoo! Jesse bounced up a few times on Ace's shoulders. Thanks, Mr. Clement. After Jesse had calmed down, Ace nodded and responded to the director. We'll be back. This place seems like it will be a good and exciting experience for all of us. And sure, I can try a sword fight. Ace looked back at Jesse. Jesse taught me a thing or two after all. Ace picked up a sword and spun it around then pointed it forward. Ready when you are! Raphael, Raphael readied his sword and held one hand behind his back, bouncing on his heels. I must warn you, young man, I was trained in the arts of rapiers for ages. <laughs> Raphael lunged forward. Yeah! Ace thought to himself. Ages? Oh gosh, this guy must be older than he looks. Ace thought the director was like 25 or something. As Raphael lunged toward him, Ace narrowly dodged to the side just in time. He stumbled a bit and then gripped his sword with both hands and held it over his chest in a defensive position. Raphael, blocked by the sword, 
backed away, waiting for the other to attack him. This wasn't really part of the audition. By now, he was just having fun with it. He could always use the excuse that the captain would have to undergo a very quick-paced sword fight. This would let him know how much training he needed and if he needed to hire a coach. So far, so good. You're good for, from what I've seen. Most people don't even have enough reaction time to block me. Ace smiled. Thank you, Mr. Clement. You flatter me. After Ace finished talking, he went in for a side jab. Raphael chuckled and moved to the side, blocking <laughs> the jab. I wasn't getting cocky, and neither should you. That's your lesson for today. A captain must always be thoughtful of his surroundings and of himself, he said as he placed his sword back on the wall. That was just a little test, my dear boy, and if you'd like, we can continue this another time. I seem to have forgotten that I have other people waiting for auditions. Ace tipped his head and watched the other put back the sword. That's good advice, and no problem. We can continue another time. Thank you again for everything. Ace extended his hand in a handshake. See you next time, Mr. Clement. I look forward to working with you. Jessie then literally bounced up and offered and extended her hand, too. What my brother said, it was fun! The blonde Frenchman smiled and extended his hand to the two of them as well, shaking Ace's hand first and then kissing Jessie's softly on her knuckles. Yes, it was a pleasure to finally meet the both of you, and I look forward to working with you. Raphael smiled and led the two outside the theater and bowed to them before returning inside with another actor. End of that one. <laughs> do you want to? End scene. And but, cut. Um, I, me and George were giggling like almost that entire time because actually our idea for the the, the script that they did mm-hmm. was another story that we wrote, and That's Ace was awesome. actually the captain. <laughs> so we were like, "Yeah, let's do this." Yeah. Is that our next one? What? Are we gonna do that one? Oh, no, no that's no, no, just no. something oh, we that's, do in our free time. Yeah, it was yes. free time. But so. and Ace said, he's like, oh, this captain seems a lot like me. It's because oh, it is him. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know. Awesome. It's, like, really confusing, but it's kind of funny. Dude. Yeah. Hey, Michelle, could you find, there should be one that has a four over there okay. somewhere in that pile. Yeah. Thank you. I was that should be it. Why, why Thank you. Why you. Why the thing that Ace and Jesse are pregnant? I thought that Ace was... And I really didn't like, no, you idiot. Oh, Ace, isn't the, Ace isn't the rock star. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, Ace is the rock star. Ace, an idiot. Ace and Jesse, like, the storybook last uh, reading, it's like, remember when Jesse was like, oh, will you be my brother? And it, like, yeah, you know, came true because the they both... Stuff. Yeah, they came true because, it, like, they both got adopted and now they oh, are literally yeah. brother and sister and it's kind of cute. What? So, what we got going next? Next is our last script of the night. Oh. And it's called By All Means. I love this one, by the way, guys. It's wonderful. Um, read by George and Michelle. I will get off the microphone right now. Yeah, so go away. So, Georgia can <laughs> have my spot. Oh, sweet. I get the director's spot. Yeah, Dude, I'm a do. cool kid. <laughs> so no, you're go. not. Aw. Dude, quit it's trying. Okay. No, George, Don't you can try. be cool. Okay. And I will never be. Because I'm <laughs> Is this as loud as I think it is? Or is I think my... it is, but it's probably good. We don't want dead air to be happening. Yeah, anymore. I just wanted to make sure my headphones weren't just like unnatural. I am loud. somehow stealing all of George's scripts tonight. Yeah, what Stop it. With you, Jamie. Wait, no, yeah, I'm like, Jamie, Jamie hand me your script. Jamie, you're such a I, You know what? I'm sorry. Just be sorry, it's just, Jamie. It's just, it's shiny. It's highlighted. and. <laughs> That is some shiny paper. That is that is pretty shiny. Ooh, our chairs are. Those are some quality recycled like uh, radio logs. <laughs> All right. Do we have any background on this one? Well, oh, you're the narrator first. Am I? Of all. Am I giving the, the background? I don't know. Okay, I will give the background. Actually, you know, with this, Someone find it out. Yeah. I think it's better if we explain the background afterward because neither me nor Georgia knew anything about each other's characters going in. Yeah, it was kind of cool like that. We're just like, hey, let's write a script, and it's like, okay, let's just. Okay, use here's these my characters. character. Here's mine. <laughs> all right, let's let's explain who they are afterward. Let's do this. All right. Who's reading what part? I'm gonna turn this a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, we've got two characters. Um, one is named Sloth, and that's by Michelle. Yep. And the other's named Abigail, and that will be by me. You're oh. listening to Stark Actors on the Airwaves. All characters appearing in this work are fictitious. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. By all means. It's a beautiful spring day, and Sloth has come to a park to chill for the day. 
It doesn't take him long to find a shady spot by the pond, and he stands silently and watches the duck swim for a minute or two before plopping himself down near the tree. He tilts his head back against the bark and closes his eyes. On the other side of the tree stands a girl named Abigail. She has a canvas out on a stand, and she is trying to find a good scene to paint. She tilts her head as she looks to the scenery in front of her. It's nice, but she would prefer a different angle. She then picks up her canvas, stand, and supplies as she travels to the other side of the tree. When she crosses, she sees a man sleeping by the base of the tree. She smiles and walks a few more feet. Abigail then sets up her canvas and starts sketching. Sloth opens an eye when he hears movement, tossing his head just enough to flip some of the too long blonde hair out of his eyes. He gives the girl a bored look, noting that she's painting, before giving his head another shake and letting the hair fall back down to cover his eyes. A few minutes later, he lets out a deep sigh. I don't think I'm going to be sleeping today either. He sighs again and lifts his head, tilting it sideways and reaching up to tuck his bangs back out of his eyes. He eyes the painting for a few seconds. Having fun? Abigail looks over at him. She smiles happily and nods with excitement. She then looks back at her painting and adds some pretty bright colors. Good to know. Abigail smiles again. She then sits down her brush and reaches into a small tan messenger bag at her side. She pulls out a small white board and a pink marker. She quickly writes on it and shows it to the other. The board reads, It's a beautiful day today, isn't it? You don't mind if I paint here, do you? Sloth blinks at the dry erase board. Not at all. I take it you're mute, then? Abigail blinks for a minute. She was surprised at how perceptive the stranger was. Most people didn't get the fact that she was mute so quickly. She nodded, though, and wrote another note on the board. Glad it's okay with you. And yes, I am. I have been for a long time. My name's Abigail. What's yours? My name's Gideon. I get called Sloth a lot, though, so if that's easier to write, feel free to use that. Abigail nods and writes another note after she clears the board. Gideon is such a nice-sounding name, though. I'd rather, I'd rather write that. Upon a closer look, Abigail wrote the name in a fancy cursive script and left the rest of the note in regular handwriting. All right, then. If you can pick fun over lazy, then by all means. Abigail closes both eyes and smiles a very happy and cute smile. She writes again. Want to watch me paint, Gideon? Sure. Either that or the ducks. Just watching them swim is pretty relaxing, isn't it? Abigail smiles and nods. Sure is. I love duckies. Oh, I know. I'll paint the duckies in just for you. We can still chat as I paint. Writing is easy. True. And thanks. This guy I know really likes ducks and uh, geese, too. I think he got me hooked on watching them. He got me hooked on a lot of stuff now that I think about it. Maybe I just have an addictive personality. Abigail draws a hand to her mouth and giggles a bit. I may be like that, too. I pick up a lot of hobbies myself and get addicted to them. Sloth nods sleepily at that. Let's see. At the moment, I'm addicted to warm baths, watching birds swim, coffee. How old are you? Bubble baths for the win. Oh, I'm 19. How about you, Gideon? (sighs) You look younger than that. Then again, I'm older than I look, too. I'm 27. I guess we both have a youthful glow about us. I would hardly say that I glow. I'm tired all the time. Radiant, then? I don't glow, whether it's healthy or unhealthy. You do, yeah, but my looking younger has nothing to do with it. It's probably just because I look like some slobby college or high school kid. Well, they say you're as young as you feel. And I feel older than a dinosaur. Why is that, Gideon? Just worn out is all. Ah, ever tried juicing? That helps me stay peppy. Juicing? Like lemon juice? Kinda. Like other things, too. Like strawberries, limes, carrots, or apples. You can juice carrots? That sounds kind of gross. I don't think... I think I'd rather just eat them as carrots. Abigail lets out another giggle. Just then, she accidentally drops her marker. Sloth just sort of looks at it and gives it a nudge with his foot. I think you dropped something. Abigail scrambles to pick it up. She quickly grabs it and writes. Yeah, this is my favorite marker. It'd be a shame if I were to lose it. What are you going to do when it runs out of ink? Use black, and then special order another one. Ah. 
And what if they stop making that kind? Gab- Abigail gasps and writes in big letters. Then I will cry. But then I'll find a new favorite color. There's usually a way around things. Isn't it better to just not get attached to it and be- to begin with? Or easier, at least. True, but I just love bright colors. I can't help it. Again, by all means. Abigail smiles. She then gazes out at the body of water in front of them. Just then, she spots a mother duck and her baby ducklings. She gasps excitably and points her hand out in the duck's direction and hopes that her new friend would notice them too. Yeah, cute, aren't they? She nods her head quickly. I wish I could have one as a pet. Are you an animal person, Gideon? Not really. I just like watching them, I guess. I don't really think I'd enjoy having a pet at all, really. Way too much work, and then you go and get attached to them, and their inevitable death is just tragic. Why bother? Abigail frowns, but then writes another quick response. Well, even though the road can be rocky, it could still be a fun journey. Sloth gives a short laugh and then gives her a weak smile. (laughs) I'd have something to say to that, but I don't want to be a broken record. Abigail smiles a soft smile. I understand. Sloth nods his head. So, where'd you hear that one? A fortune cookie, a quote, or just something you came up with yourself? Tucking a strand of her hair back, she shrugs and writes. I came up with it myself. It's my motto. It's a nice one. I think mine is... He tilts his head back to think. Do as much as you can with as little effort as you can. Abigail smirks and writes. Well, I agree with you as much as you can part. But hey, what you said earlier, right? By all means. She then finishes with a smile face at the end of her note. So you're saying, by all means, be lazy. That's sort of a paradox, isn't it? He smirks lazily up at her. Abigail jolts a bit and giggles. More like, be yourself. What if you can't? What if you were in a position where you could be fired for it, or you could have people relying on you to keep the job? Or, hey, what if you could be killed? He shakes his head. I appreciate it, and it's a nice sentiment. But I hate to break it to you. It uh, it doesn't always work that way. It's the sad truth of the world. Abigail frowns as she writes her response. I'm not sure how to respond to that. But I do know that's life. that life's not always fair. She pulls a bit at her scarf. <sighs> Sorry, I didn't mean to bring you down. Be happy while you can, right? I mean, I'm a bit of a downer, but I enjoy the little moments like these while they last. She smiles again. Don't worry about it. I'll take all the moments, good and bad. Abigail looks up at Sloth for a moment. She then writes another message and holds up to his face, holds it up to his face at a respectable distance. Thanks, Gideon, for chatting with me today. It's nice to have someone to listen. Sloth smiles. No problem. You wouldn't think it by the way people act, but... Listening takes no effort. Physical effort, anyway. He laughs and holds a finger up to his lips. <laughs> but that's between you and me, okay? Abigail happily nods. Sure thing, Gideon. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> That's making a face. <laughs> okay, yeah. I read that one earlier today, and oh my goodness. I Who was I telling? Was I telling both of you? That I was reading it, and when I was in reading it, like, whenever I watch shows with kittens, puppies, or wedding shows, I, like, sit there and scream out loud and squeal and just keep saying, this is so cute. And I was reading their display and was doing that Aww. the whole time. I'm like, this is so cute. Read I read this. <laughs> I really like this one. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Georgia, do you care to explain your character first? Like, anything, I mean, obviously became pretty obvious that she's mute. Yeah. A <laughs> little bit. A <laughs> little bit. A little bit. Um, Abigail, she's basically kind of what's explained in the story. I mean, she's mute. She's 19. Um, but she's got, like, a lot of talents. Like, it's kind of mentioned that she paints. She paints, um, let me see. What else she does? She paints, um, she's a very, like, an animal handler. She's really good with pets. Hmm. Um, just a lot of variety of things. She's really into the arts. I can picture her playing, like, musical instruments, too. So she's kind of like Rapunzel. (laughs) <laughs> kind of, kind of, in a way, I'd say. Uh, Only her, she's, her hair is short, so she can't Sloth's be a Rapunzel. backstory is a bit more complicated. First of all, he lied about his age. He's, um, he, he is Sloth because he is the actual sin of Sloth. <laughs> Abigail had no idea.